Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Museum's Night Studio for this uh, today's edition of Inside Media. Hi, I'm John Molesky. I'll serve as your moderator. Let me introduce you now to our guest. Today's guest has created the definitive catalog of American iconic imagery. His photographs are seen around the world and have appeared on TV, on book covers, and in magazines like National Geographic, Newsweek, and Time. My guess is you've seen a Joe Soane picture, whether you know it was his or not. Throughout this 4th of July weekend, also, we're going to be showing Joe's work on the big screen in the Great Hall of News out here in the museum. So you can take a look at that after the program if you haven't seen it yet. But right now, please help me welcome Joe Soam to the program. <laughs> Thanks. Joe, so let me, uh, I, you know, I, I, I wanna, I've known this guy for a lot of years, so I don't want to assume that my, my sense of the story, the Joe Soam story, is accurate. I'll do some fact checking here, but you started out as a history teacher. Is that correct? That was your first job? Yeah, my love has always been for the United States, especially the, um, I got attached to the 18th century and the founding of America. And so when you, uh, fresh out of college, you thought you were going to teach young people about yeah, this? Yeah, that was when they seemed to have too many teachers, and um, I, w I was, not, not invited were to, you were to fired? teach. No, I never got the chance to, <laughs> to, to, uh, chance to teach, and, and so except for substituting. And, and, and but even when you substituted, this what you decided this wasn't for you. You had other ideas. Well, once I got into the classroom, because I did get into the classroom, I found out. I, I guess I had this. You know, if they made you do student teaching before you graduate maybe you wouldn't have chosen it as a career path because once I got into the classroom, I actually found out, oh, this is a lot of spitwad control and uh, discipline, <laughs> and I'm not much of a disciplinarian, yeah. so um, I'm more one to be disciplined than to, <laughs> to execute that. So by the time I got in there, I, I kind of thought there might be a better classroom. I had this, you know, thinking it was more prof uh, like a professor. Yeah. But Are there any educators among us? Any teachers in the crowd? Yeah. You know of what he speaks, right? This classroom control thing. My wife is a teacher, and somebody told her on her first job, "Don't smile until after the new year, because you don't want to show any weakness to the students." I mean, that is horrible. Uh, but so, so you you leave the classroom and you get this idea about photography. Was that an interest, or did you stumble into it? How did that happen? Well, interestingly enough, my father, who had a, a television store so and uh, when you had a television store in the 50s and 60s you would not have one television you would have 40 televisions right so i basically grew up watching t i thought everybody had 40 tvs <laughs> so i would go and watch in for instance as i was seeing all this today at the museum i saw the uh, jfk assassination uh coverage uh afterwards on 40 tv sets and somehow mm -hmm. I guess the media made an imprint on me. My father was um, a photographer, an amateur, but he had a 3D camera. What's so, a 3D? You mean to well, take with the glasses? Well, it had two lenses with, uh, yeah. with that. And then my father lost his eye um, and gave me that camera. And that camera became, so the first pictures I ever took were three-dimensional. And I'd have all my friends come over and we'd put 3D glasses on and most of them found that wearing the 3D glasses was more entertaining than the pictures I'd taken. So you're self-taught or trained by your father? Is that it? I'm pretty much self-taught. I have taken one class in photography and zillions of hours in American history. And so you, if I get this straight again, you, do you buy a mobile home and you decide to travel America and photograph the entire country? Yeah, well, you know, my, my last name is Soam, and I'm, I'm always convinced um, that there's a pun everywhere, so I created a company for that, and that was Chromosome, Chromosome Media. And that I, that film mattered. That's yeah, what, you know. and, I needed, and I needed an RV because ultimately, um, well, that was when Motel 6 was 36, uh, 29.95, I think. And uh, so I, I, I did think living in your vehicle made sense to me, so I got uh, an RV and I called it the Chroma Home. Oh boy, it gets cornier, <laughs> folks, hang in there. No, so, so uh, what, but what about this idea of the visions of America, of chronicling America from sea to shining sea photographically? Was that a, an early idea or did, you, did that become an expression of what was happening as you were traveling around? Well, I'd always had a passion for all things America. And growing up in St. Louis and kind of the belly button of America, and in fact, the, the place where I bought my very first home was 
uh, turned out to be the population center of the United States in Jefferson County. So I had this kind of connection on the Mississippi that, you know, I could be the eyes of the common man. And specifically, I also love travel and any, ex any way that I could figure out how to make a living by traveling, in essence, following my passion. And my passion is chronicling the founding fathers and how their vision of America has manifested in the 20th and then now the 21st century. So if you were defining your, your subject or your subject matter, what would you, how would you describe it? Well, most recently, it's, and it's taken me a while to actually be able to, to put it in a box, but I would say photographing democracy. Because photography, like being a doctor, is about finding a specialty. You know, and um, if you have a kidney problem, you're not going to go to a brain surgeon. So in the same thing, a guy that does wedding photography is not necessarily going to shoot, you know, presidential campaigns. So what my, my goal was, was to capture all things about America, that all of our lives are pictures of really ordinary days across the 50 states on a good day, meaning a good day for me is the sun is out, the sky is blue. I don't like white skies in general. I like blue skies. I'm kind of a, a color photographer. And then over a period of time, as it now has become almost three decades, you assemble these pictures and together they create a photo, uh, uh, a, a photo uh, composite of democracy. So photographing democracy, because democracy is really what makes the United States and its citizens unique because it's almost part of our DNA. Mm -hmm. It's in everything we do, whether we're playing baseball games or whether we're on Main Street USA, um, how it affects us and how we interact in this democratic nation of ours in essence becomes my subject matter. And, and a look at the SOM catalog, you'll find uh, panoramic digitals of all 50 states, all 50 state capitals, every iconic image. You talk about your birthplace, the St. Louis Arch, the Statue of Liberty, the Empire State Building, anything you could think of, uh, and then all the, these small scenes as well. Now, when people run for president and travel around the country, and we've all heard them when they drop out of the race, one of the things they often talk about is what a privilege it was to be in every hamlet and town and city in America and meet the American people up close and all those things. And they, they often talk about how it changed them or how they learned new things about the country. You've had similar experience while not hawking for votes. What did you learn about America on your journeys that you didn't know going in? Um, I guess... That was a long-winded question, wasn't it? Mike? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, it, it always creates a, a geographical confusion because I'm a person that... Um, instantly relates to almost every place that I go to. So whenever my wife and I are in a new location, whether it's New England or Sedona, Arizona, or Monument Valley, I mean, half the time I'm looking at real estate because I'm thinking, not that I can buy it all, but uh, I just love all the different places within America. Uh -huh. And whether it's Monument Valley or New England or in places in, you know, just about any place in California, I'm, I'm basically always loving our geography. And uh, secondly, I just find the way that uh, Americans express this democratic instinct always entertaining. And so whether I'm just driving down the road and see clothing hanging on a clothesline, I think that's a photo opportunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not exactly Richard Nixon with his uh, arms up like this saying farewell, but again, many of the photographs that uh, appear in the museum are really, I think, about extraordinary moments that maybe happen once in a lifetime. Mine are a series of ordinary moments that we all see daily. And when you put them all together, it just kind of reveals a portrait uh, of a unique nation. Mm -hmm. and well, well, let's look at some of those. Now, what, what we're going to do is we're going to show you some of uh, Joe's photos, and then what you and I can do is talk over them, and, and you could give us some, some insight into any of the shots that spur a, an idea or a moment. So here we go. Well, we start off with something very iconographic. Well, the White House is easier to photograph 10 years ago than it is today because Security? now, yeah, if, if you come with a tripod. Oh, here's a good. Yeah, and this, this woman is from India, and... Um, 
Was I just there a naturalization ceremony that day? Or no, it no? just uh, she just happened to be there, and I was there. Oh, there's a naturalization. There is a uh, Hispanic becoming an IBM businessman becoming a U.S. citizen in Los Angeles, and with his flag. And this is probably shouldn't be done tried at home. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a Filipino American throwing his child in the air, and and I caught them in in, in about a sixtieth of a second. And also uh, you, on Memorial Day, you never met a flag you didn't like, did you? No. <laughs> Flags uh, are in, La thing. in Los Angeles, this was during a great drought in the Midwest in Indiana, and you can't see the drought there, but the farmer shared his travails in having his crops go belly up. Again, another citizenship swearing in. I've done a lot of these. My favorite is at Thomas Jefferson's house on July 4th. Um, this is one of my favorite areas of Pennsylvania. It's the only state that I've ever seen that puts the barns right on the road. <laughs> <laughs> Easy access in PA. Yeah, and the cherry, cherry, blossoms. cherry blossoms, for every good shot like this I, I get, there's probably five years I showed up to try to get it when it was, sorry, you were a week too late. This is actually Floyd's Barbershop, which inspired the Andy Griffith show in North huh. Carolina. And, and we'll, what photo album is complete without the polka? Yeah. yeah. Well, this is a, a French American. One of my goals in photographing America is to capture all people from all nations living within this country. And this is the popsicle you get when you take a good picture. <laughs> the guy get the cast on his end. That's what I want to know. <laughs> this is, I like looking down on people, and this gave me a chance to look down on this. Oh, no, please. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, when you take a shot like this, do you ask the parents permission? Uh, sometimes I do. Yeah. And this, this is um, uh, in Washington, D.C. I knew there was a democracy boulevard, but I couldn't find it. Simple shot, but it took me three hours to find the sign. Photographing <laughs> democracy literally. There we go. <laughs> Uh, Mount Classic. Rushmore on a good day, and um, white puffy clouds always make my day. Uh, a blue sky without a white puffy cl cloud is, is a tragedy. There you go. Well, thanks. We'll, we'll look at some more a little later. But, uh, let me ask you, you know, when you're categorizing guests and you're trying to ID them, uh, you're a hard guy to categorize. You, photographer doesn't quite seem to do it. Photojournalist doesn't quite seem to do it. How do you describe yourself? What is it that you do? Well, I think um, that's a good question. And I would say my work is less about capturing the news, which is all about what the museum does. And mine is, I would call myself a photo historian. Photo historian. Yeah, because I have photographed virtually every single reenactment of our past. Because again, I'm interested in the American story. And in order to tell the American story, I need actors. But I'm not going to hire an actor. This is not about Hollywood. So I've kind of fallen in love over the last 10 years over people that give up their life. That, you know, they're lawyers and accountants and business people and teachers. But then for two or three weekends a year, they become George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. Or most recently, I was in Reading, Pennsylvania, where they reenacted World War II. And it was 1,100 reenactors, including they had Japanese, Nazis, uh, Marines, uh, bombers, um, and, and the, the Andrews sisters. It just went on and on and on. And, and also uh, putting up the flag uh, in Iwo Jima. So, and it's again, I'm not trying to mimic history, but I am trying to capture the American story and obviously, I'm not the only one, because these people are trying to tell that story by not letting us forget, by reenacting it. So um, that's one of the many ways that I capture our history. Other things is I capture presidential campaigns, which yeah. become history. You know, we're going to look at some of those pictures, but I want to let you know now we're going to take some of your questions and comments. So if you'd like to make your way to the microphone, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, while you do that, I, I wanted to follow up. Well, you're not a wedding photographer, but you shot a wedding a couple nights ago in Philadelphia. Tell us about that. Yeah, I did. This, this is um, every once in a while you stumble into these events, but in, in Philadelphia um, two nights ago, the reenactor for Benjamin Franklin fell in love with the reenactor of Betsy Ross. <laughs> and and uh, you can't make this stuff up. So on, on July 3rd, in front of Independence Hall, uh, Ben Franklin married Betsy Ross. 
And uh, also later, I was told that was the origin of the B and B because they are going to open up a bed and breakfast. <laughs> there you go. Now, before we go to a question, we're going to look at one more set of photos. And uh, you mentioned that you also photograph contemporary political events. Yeah. And here are just a sampling of some of your coverage on the current campaign trail. Great profile shot of Ms. Clinton. Yeah, I call that one um, Bill's right brain. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, who do we have? And next? then also that's the high death moment, you know. Oh, now this is great. Well, this is uh, this is an Iowa moment. This is how they express their democracy. Voting with corn kernels. Yeah, but I know it's carny, but you have to vote with corn. Oh boy. And there's <laughs> all the candidates. Now, this is possibly an example why Fred Thompson didn't win. I don't know. I thought the guy with the piglet always wins. Is well, that, uh, or it's the tallest. You know, there, yeah. there, many people <laughs> compare politicians and pigs and things, and I didn't do that. <laughs> but I know that um, the winning presidential uh, candidate will not be captured with a pig in his hand. Now, now, this is Barack Obama in bumper cars. And the next day in the presidential debate, when Hillary attacked him, he said, well, you know, to prepare for my debate, I took a bumper car uh, uh, ride. <laughs> and this is him with his little, his uh, darling little is two daughters. Is this Iowa? Yeah, this is uh, Des Moines. And this is going up in one of those dreadful rides, and only he was smiling, go, going to the very top where they drop you like a rock. Yeah. And I, I thought that was kind of a metaphor for his presidential climb and ups and downs. Yeah. And of course, he would smile even if he didn't like yeah, the ride. Even if he didn't like it. That's what politicians do at state fairs. Hi, you're first. Go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, recently in this country, we've um, run to this thing where if you want to photograph the Washington Monument or the Jefferson Memorial, you, you can't bring a tripod if you're a professional journalist. You have to register and go through hoops. Is it becoming harder and harder to take pictures of the public monuments of this country? Yeah, it is, absolutely. And. Um, the, I, I call them the tripod police, and uh, they're the bane of my existence in general. And, um, but it's a classic case, if there's a will, there's a way. And even when you get a tripod permit, which I find kind of offensive, uh, to shoot the US Capitol, it's for 24 hours. Well, it's easy for me, because I can set up a still camera, uh, as you can, um, and get a shot in five minutes. Also. I sneak a lot of shots as much as possible because frequently, by the time they're trying to yell at you, you've already gotten the shot and you're gone. That's more, <laughs> uh, that's more troubling for my friend who shoots time-lapse cinema because he needs to set up a camera for 24 hours and let clouds go through. But for him, he's gone to disguises. He actually shows up has one disguise with three different coats, and then he walks by to see that his camera, and his camera is disguised within the, the bushes nearby. <laughs> so, so long story short is don't let them stop you. You can get any shot you want. I've shot 90% of the shots I wanted without press passes. I would much rather have a press pass whenever possible, but it doesn't stop me in general. Um, if you want it, you can go get it. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Break the law, if necessary, <laughs> to get your shot. Children, I'm sorry. So what's the craziest thing you have ever done to get a shot? Oh, gee, there's, there's, um, there's <laughs> so, so one, OK, one year. Well, I, I can tell. Yeah. Well, probably, the, um, I was President Clinton's photographer for the 1992 campaign, not for the White House, but for the Democratic National Committee. Mm -hmm. And the final um, photo events were so exhausting um, that, well, President Clinton's final day was uh, 10 events in 24 hours from the East Coast to the West Coast. And by the end of this, he was never tired. I'm sure he drank a lot of coffee. And, um, but I ended up, as we got close to the inaugural, I forgot to get my inaugural press pass. And I, by the time I got there, right down the street from you know, right here, uh, basically a half million people were coming in. 
and I did not have a press pass. And this is another answer to the gentleman. So basically I said, I'm not going to photograph uh, this governor becoming the president of the United States and, and not cover the inaugural. So I stood in line in front of the Secret Service. Everybody had a ticket. I had no press pass, no ticket. I pulled out a blank sheet of paper and gave it to them and walked right through. <laughs> and then at that point, I had to, uh, just to add slightly more onto it, I could not get to my press position then because the bugles were starting to, uh, to you go. You didn't have another blank sheet of paper? I didn't oh, have another blank. So I climbed over a chain link fence <laughs> carrying three cameras, walked up to my press stand, which had been given away, my spot, which was waiting for me, and finally some photographer just said, um, tell them you're a film carrier and you can walk behind the press stand and then you can shoot out so that you have a half a million people in your view when the president's being sworn in. So that's the shot that I got. Who knew that a discussion with a photo historian would turn into a national security issue? <laughs> <here with us? laughs> yes, sir. Technology has changed so much over your career. Where do you think it's going and how has it impacted you in taking uh, pictures? Well, that's, that's a great, uh, that's a great um, question. Um, I did start off you know, shooting film, I shot off, I started shooting Kodachrome, then I found out that Kodak ultimately lost its interest in the professional photographer, uh, thus the colors were off, magenta and greens were off in Kodachrome, so I quickly switched to Ektachrome. And then now about six years ago when the uh, megapixels got up to a, a decent amount, uh, for, for me about 11 megapixels or more, the more megapixels the better. Um, I switched to digital. I still have one film camera left. And where it's going, I would say, and it's certainly a gas to be able to see your pictures almost instantly after you take them. Um, it's, it's, it used to be that I would come back on a six week trip and see all the pictures at once. You don't have that excitement anymore. But where it's going, uh, for good or for bad, uh, many people believe that still photography, per se, will be somewhat co-opted by high-resolution digital motion where you can grab a still photograph from motion. Mm -hmm. And I think this is probably something that's been discussed before, but you may not see still photos uh, the way that they're celebrated in this museum. And uh, how many of you are walking around with phones that can take pictures? Look at that. And, and how, how about phones that can shoot video as well? And how many uh, have phones that can take a phone call? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody raised their hand. No, that, co that costs too much. The, yes, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Uh, what is your favorite photograph that you've ever taken? And what was the most difficult event that you've ever had to photograph? Well, that inaugural was pretty challenging. Uh, you know, and again, it's... It's never doing this that's difficult. This is easy. I practice all the time. You know, it's, it's like lifting weights and stuff. But um, um, I think shooting the U.S. Capitol a few blocks from here for the bicentennial of the United States Constitution, I was not allowed to get close to President Reagan because I didn't have a press pass. So usually, I am always trying to, when I'm denied what I want to be able to do, which is most of the time, I try to figure out, well, where's the win out of this bad situation? So I ended up being so far back that I didn't know that they were gonna release for the last time ever in Washington, D.C., red, white, and blue balloons that went across the U.S. Capitol. And because the next day it says, environmentally incorrect, they should have never done that. And in the meantime, I had 10,000 red, white, and blue balloons. And the guys that were close to President Reagan didn't get that shot. But I was in the back, and I got a shot uh, that, that has been published over and over. In fact, when we went to our hotel, we opened Welcome to Washington, and it was a double-page spread. So the, jo the joy of doing what I do is that you can see, you can get paid for what you did 23 years ago, or in this case, 21. Yes, sir, I know. You're the guy who reads the Washington Post. Welcome to the microphone. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, what's been, what was your favorite state that you went to to take pictures and why? My favorite state? Well, I do kind of like Vermont. Uh, I think Vermont is not completely into the 21st century yet. And uh, 
There's, if you still want to get a sense of what we may have looked like um, yesterday, you can go through Vermont because I'm convinced that um, many of those people don't watch TV there. I found they're all very funny. In fact, we've named them the funny people because I, we think they entertain themselves. And, <laughs> and number two, they don't have billboards. Uh, billboards are the enemy. So, you know, like when you're taking photographs, it's, uh, in this case, we have a young man in a blue shirt, so we may want to crop things out. So photos are really about what you leave behind and what you focus on. Uh, so in this case, we'll focus on your blue shirt, and if I were taking pictures, you'd probably be my favorite shot right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And keep reading newspapers. Good job, young man. Yes, come on up. You're next. Hi. Make sure you don't tear any knee cartilage. We'll help you out with the microphone. There. Um, who actually uh, mostly publishes your pictures? Uh, newspapers, d magazines. Where do you see them the most? The yeah. internet. Well, this is it. It's sort of gotten out of control. Um, before the internet, I had an idea who was using my pictures. But uh, now, I, I believe, that to, the, to the best of my knowledge, the math suggests that I'm published 10,000 10, times a year. Uh, so consequently, I don't know where they're going to be. <laughs> and I found them in the darndest places, including um, going to Australia uh, with my passport out going through customs. And they had a big sign that said, welcome to Australia. But it was my picture of an Arizona road. <laughs> <that> <laughs> and so. Where did you get the dingo? That's what I've had. Is that the right country? So anyway, there are. Uh, this is fast. What you've told, I've heard this before. This, this is fascinating. Joe will say that he'll just get on an airplane and pick up the magazine and there's a picture of his. He didn't know that it was there. Or I've called you, I've looked at a Newsweekly and seen a picture in Time or Newsweek or something like that. Could you imagine that you're doing your work and you have no idea where it's landing until you stumble upon it? Well, I, you know, if I were a musician, I probably would be, you know, the guy that played on Don Henley's album or Stevie Wonder's <laughs> album. But, oh, that's Joe, what's his name? Um, and he's on, a thousand albums. A studio musician. Yeah, a studio musician. Yeah. So the best way to see my name is to ha travel with a magnifying glass. And then if you have a book and you think it might be one of my photographs, rip the spine apart so that your $30 book is now ruined and take out your magnifying glass. And in that binding, you might see my name. <laughs> if you don't, I'm sorry about the book. <laughs> The, uh, I want to ask you before we run out of time about your latest project. There was a reason you were in Philadelphia. It wasn't just the marriage yeah. of Betsy Ross and Benjamin Franklin. Tell us what you, you've got planned for 2009. Well, after photographing democracy for 30 years, I've uh, decided it's time to assemble the photographs into a mosaical. So that's our term. But it's a mosaic portrait, but it needs to be done not only in imagery, and ideas of the Founding Fathers, but in original music. So I have a friend um, that is a world-renowned musician named Roger Kelway. You can Google him. And uh, he is an Academy Award-nominated uh, uh, composer. Jazz pianist. Jazz pianist. He did All in the Family, the little honky-tonk piano. Uh, he kind of created new age music when he did the cello quartets. And he thrives on bridging uh, the jazz world, pop, and classical together. So what he's doing is composing a 50-minute piece of original music in 13 uh, uh, sections in three movements. And basically, he, we, together with Alan and Marilyn Bergman, who are Barbara Streisand songwriters, producing a multimedia symphony uh, for America called Visions of America. It will premiere in Philadelphia uh, five days after the presidential inaugural, uh, January 25 through February 1 at Kimball Center. This is a lot to remember. I'm rehearsing yes. this in my head. But uh, it's basically being billed as a presidential inaugural for the people of America. And overhead, the orchestra, uh, 70 performers on stage, will be a 40-foot screen, and in in 1080i, much like the big screen in the museum 
exactly the same size, uh, basically my life's work and my 50-state portrait of the United States taken over 30 years will be projected to music. Uh, and we're planning on having narration and visionary quotes of the Founding Fathers. Sorry I couldn't do that in a shorter time. Wow. Well, and then what will you do in 2010? No, I'm only... No. <laughs> before, let's take a look at some more photos before we, we completely run out of time. And these are some photos that will be appearing in that yeah, program. Yeah, that's the 100th anniversary of the Statue of Liberty, taken from an aircraft carrier. That's um, everybody's friend, Thomas Jefferson. That's my top-selling photograph right there, the American flag. Mount Rushmore on a good day. Uh, the Washington Monument without the top. Great sunlight on that, Mr. Lincoln. Right yeah, there. the shadows. And a storm coming in from Pennsylvania. And the Washington Monument at sunset. And Was that the, the roof oh, of the old museum? That's the old right. museum. And, and the cherry blossoms, blossoms on a good day. And a ticker tape parade in New York City. And there's those balloons there that you'll is. never see again. And there's the, is and that there the shot they you are. talked about? That's the red, white, and blue balloons. Best selling yeah. ever. Look for them in your um, uh, Welcome to Washington shot in your <laughs> hotel room. Well, Joe Soam, thanks very much for joining us today and, and continued success. Good luck on that project. Well, thanks, John. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your time in the museum. Thanks for joining us. Well, that was fun. Yeah, thanks. You want Bruce, you want to oh. pose, pose for a shot for you here? Ready? Sure. Three, two, one. Stay there, take two, three, two, one, go, take.